like the one in the beginning, in case you get in a big time or something. Yeah, so I don't hide, so maybe yeah, uh, some maybe are still lost in the mountain. Live there. Yeah. Okay. Let's get started. So yeah. before we start the session, would you like to make an announcement? Yeah. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy that you made it back from the hike, at least some of you. Uh, I have three, three quick announcements. Uh, first, that we were asked by the school to make sure that everybody here knows that you have to leave your room by 10 a.m. tomorrow morning so that they can start cleaning them. So it's important. The second is that they asked us kindly to provide feedback on the school that helps them to improve future schools. So outside in the coffee table, you will see questionnaires. It's very short. They just want rankings. So instead of Yelp, we will do it over paper. So please do that. The last item, um, we found out that one of us mistakenly thinks that the beer is free. So by now there is more than 50 euro difference and somebody, somebody thinks the beer is free. Uh, the beer was not free. So we would like to ask the individual who, who assumed that this was a free beer to pay uh, the for the beer that was consumed. Um, somebody will have to pay it, so we asked the person who drank the beer to, uh, to pay for that. Okay, that's, yeah. So thank you, <laughs> Sa thank you. <laughs> so in Hachi Nation today, we are here today with three individuals who said they were happy to participate. They asked for the session today, they were like, yes, we can do it. So if you, thanks for the question. So if you put money, if, yeah, if you put money or you put your name there, that both counts as a payment. So if you put your name on the paper, then you have to go and pay for it. But you should pay ideally this evening would be a good time okay so but but those are contents you should not have done both but uh, okay but so we know that there is one person assuming there is free beer because the person went to the kitchen stuff and asked when is the free beer back and uh, so uh, it's not just the counting error. There's a conceptual mistake. Um, for a brown dwarf, a field brown dwarf, we have uh, typically log g equal 5, which g in centimeters square per second, while for young giant of the planets, we expect more uh, log g equal 3.5 to 4, so typically 1 to 2 order of magnitude lower. And uh, we also observe brown dwarf for a large range of temperature, so covering all temperatures of uh, exoplanet we could observe. And finally, we have high quality spectra, 
and many observations of bone dwarfs, so providing statistical information about their atmosphere. So this is the famous classical uh, color magnitude diagram of field bone dwarfs, so Mark already, already detailed it a lot, so I'm not going to spend too much time. But so we observe a, a really sharp transition between L dwarf and T dwarf, and uh, it occurs at an effective temperature of around 1,300 K. And the favored hypothesis to explain it is that uh, silicate and iron clouds form in the photosphere of L dwarf, so blocking the spectral windows and making the object redder. And for colder objects like T dwarf, so these clouds form deeper in the atmosphere and do not affect the spectra in colors anymore. So I added also in this diagram uh, the photometry of uh, young and very low gravity brown dwarf in purple, and also some directly imaged exoplanets in green. And so what you can notice is that all these objects appear redder than brown dwarf, so it seems that there is a reddening effect for low gravity objects, so as if they were more cloudy. And our goal was to develop the a kind of simple and physical clone model which can reproduce both the photometry and spectra of uh, bone dwarf and young giant exoplanets and quite self-consistently. And so for, for that, we use uh, the 1D model ExoRM, which is a radiative convective model which solves the equilibrium iteratively. Uh, it also includes non-equilibrium chemistry, so it's a really good point for, uh, for this model. We have the list of opacities here. And uh, so for the clone model, we included iron, silicate, sulfide, and water clouds. And we compute for the cloud distribution, taking into account the vertical mixing and the sedimentation. So we can also simulate with this model inhomogeneous cloud cover, uh, as in the paper by uh, Morley et al. So, sorry. Uh, so to solve the, the cloud distribution, we have to solve this equation, so from the Ackerman and Marley paper, uh, you have here KZZ, which is the uh, vertical eddy diffusion coefficient. And we use for that a parameterization also from uh, Ackerman and Marley, so based on the mixing length theory. And uh, it depends on the convective heat flux, which uh, we compute with our model. And um, for the radiative region, so where there is no convection, we use a minimal value to still have mixing, which should be due to uh, gravity waves. And uh, also we have overshooting between the convective and the radiative region. So if you have here some uh, KZZ profiles so obtained with the model for different effective temperature and uh, high gravity. And they are quite similar to, to some 2D simulations by uh, Feitag et al. So they seem to be quite realistic. Um, so for uh, computing the cloud distribution, we also need to make assumptions about the particle size. And in fact, in our model, we have three options. So we can first simply fix the radii of cloud particles, so the same value everywhere in the atmosphere. Or we can use the parameter Fz or F rain. And finally, we can also use some simple microphysics, so computing characteristic time scales from a paper from Rosso 1978. So we did the test with uh, these three options, and we found that uh, all options allow to reproduce the LT transition and the photometry of both brown dwarf and directly made exoplanets. But for the, the first two options, we need to change the three parameter uh, between brown dwarf and young giant exoplanets. While with the simple microphysics, we can use the same parameter to reproduce both. So I'm going to describe only this last option. Uh, so as I told you, we, we have to compute so characteristic time scales. Uh, we included so the vertical mixing, the sedimentation, the condensation growth, and the coalescence. So I'm not going to detail uh, all this time scale, but just um, there is only one free parameter in these formulas, which is S, so the supersaturation, which is the fraction of vapor above saturation, and it is estimated to be typically between 10 to minus 3 to 10 to minus 1. And so I show you now directly the results uh, with this model. So you have again the color magnitude diagram. Uh, we computed photometric curves with the model, uh, assuming 
fixed uh, surface gravity and we change the effective temperature from 400K to 2000K. And uh, so you, you have first in blue the case without cloud. So you see it's much too blue, uh, shifted to the left. And this line includes silicate and iron clouds. And we change the uh, surface gravity from log g equal five in light blue to log g equal uh, three in red. And so what you can see is that we reproduce well uh, for this value of supersaturation. We reproduce well the photometry of L dwarf and the LT transition. It's not as sharp as in the data, but it's still pretty good. And uh, when we decrease the gravity, all curves are shifted to towards uh, the right, and we can match so the photometry of uh, low gravity objects, so this low gravity brown dwarf and this young uh, giant exoplanets. And uh, another, uh, so this reddening effect is mostly due to the fact that with the low gravity, cloud particles sediment more slowly, and also the vertical mixing is more efficient with the low gravity. And uh, another point of this uh, model is that we should, uh, can expect that there should be a brown dwarf, low gravity brown dwarf, or young giant exoplanet in this part of the diagram, which is currently empty. So we can, uh, we also added the uh, effect of sulfide clouds, sulfide clouds in the model, which allow to, uh, to match the photometry of T dwarf. Uh, in fact, sulfide clouds are very efficient uh, to produce reddening. And we had to use either a high value of supersaturation or inhomogeneous cloud cover in order to match the, the data. Um, finally, one interesting aspect of this model is that we compute so the clouds and chemistry self-consistently, and so we can investigate the coupling between both. And so you have here temperature profiles, so in orange with clouds and in blue without clouds for different effective temperature from 700 to 1600K. And what you can notice is that the presence of clouds produce a strong warming, so typically around 200K, almost everywhere in the atmosphere, and it's particularly strong for L dwarf. And we would expect that this warming uh, would shift chemical equilibrium and change molecular abundances, in particular for the, the equilibrium between mason and CO. And in fact, you have here uh, the evolution of the mason mixing ratio as a function of the effective temperature. Uh, for thick lines uh, without clouds, um, no, sorry, uh, with a high gravity, sorry, and dashed line with a low gravity. So red, red lines uh, are for cloudless atmospheres and blue lines for cloudy atmospheres. And so what you can see is that just first by decreasing the, the surface gravity here between these uh, two curves, two red curves, there is a reduction of typically one order of magnitude of the Mason abundance. So that's just a gravity effect on the uh, temperature profile but also by adding clouds. So there is this effect of this uh, greenhouse warming, which reduces the, the Mason abundance, as you can see here. And it's particularly strong, so for L dwarf before the LT transition. And in fact, that has two consequences. First, it's helped to explain the sudden change of the Mason to CO ratio at the LT transition that we observe for L dwarf, for, for bond dwarf. So we observe a quick change in the Mason abundance. And also it helps to explain the observed Mason depletion for uh, uh, young giant exoplanet with temperature between 1000 and 1200K, like the HR8799C, um, for which you have here an upper limit of the Mason abundance obtained by Konopaki et al. And with the presence of clouds, we can uh, explain this, uh, this strong Mason depletion. And uh, finally, we also compare our model to, to spec spectra of brown dwarf. So you have here one L dwarf and one T dwarf. So you have in red the observation and in blue the model. So you can see that we can fit quite well the, the spectra. I want to insist that here we use our basic uh, value of supersaturation and we just change gravity and, te and temperature in order to match the data. And uh, so finally, we are also using this model so to fit uh, sphere data 
And in fact, we, uh, it seems that most ob object observed with sphere appears very cloudy, and we need such model to explain these observations. And that's my summary. And uh, just we will uh, make the model grids uh, freely available online, and I hope you quite soon. And uh, thank you very much. I mean, yeah, I guess if you are not, um, it, it might, if your, um, your warming goes uh, deep enough to reach the region where there is quenching between, uh, for Mason, yes, it would have an impact. So we can expect that it could change uh, potentially uh, the Mason and sea abundances. Yeah, the, the main point is that um, you need to be at disequilibrium. If you are at equilibrium, so if you look at a, a really hot, hot Jupiter, uh, you may not see differences on the day side. Uh, however, if you are at uh, disequilibrium and uh, that the, the clouds on the night side tend to increase the temperature, it might have an effect. Uh, yeah, to the same? Yeah, so, so if the heat of the neutrino star is in a heat, in a, if you have a heat um, in a chain of one kilogram gradient of the orbit of Jupiter, you probably also get the effect of uh, overheating during the black hole mass. Here? Yeah. Yeah. Um, my personal thinking is that uh, uh, it may be related to the the feedback of clouds, the relative feedbacks of clouds on the vertical mixing. Uh, so here we are still using simple 1D models with the parameterization for the KZZ. And I, I think we really need to look at uh, what should be the vertical mixing with 3D models, and in particular, what would be the feedback by clouds on this mixing, and how we could change so the, the vertical mixing and the, the cloud formation. Uh, here? Uh, no. No. Uh, the yes. The blue blue plants, yes. Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> maybe we have other data right now, so it's maybe more. more uh, I don't remember exactly. It's uh, it's quite small. Uh, <laughs> maybe the size of the point, but not really much bigger. Yeah, I think it's uh, more or less a s around the size of the point, but uh, I'm not totally sure. So thanks, Miku. So um, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Ben Lu. I'm from University of Arizona. So today I'm going to show you the latest result that we have um, in resolving the vertical cloud structure in this in an unusually red and dusty atmosphere. 
So this result is part of under the program of HST Cloud Atlas survey, which have 118 HST orbit, and this and uh, this result is a the collaborative effort uh, with many people, including Mark and Didier Salman, Daniel and D and Ifan. So, so we are here because clouds are important for sure. However, I want to focus more on emphasize that what is the impact of a vertical cloud structure on the atmosphere? So we know that the cloud thickness have a significant impact on the relative fi feedback to the atmosphere by heating up the atmosphere uh, at a different pressure layer. Also, the cloud vertical structure is reflect, reflecting, reflect uh, the upward vertical mixing and the setting time scale. So this, uh, um, by studying the vertical cloud structure, it tells us about how the cloud formation um, times go in the uh, in the cloud formation. Also, from an observer perspective, um, vertical cloud structure have a significant impact on what the pressure level we are looking at, no matter in the transmission, spectroscopy, or in the phase curves, especially in the near infrared region. So, as Benjamin mentioned before, um, in order to constrain the, to test our cloud formation theory, we can use brown dwarf. Um, in, uh, to test um, what, it, what is the impact of a cloud vertical structure across different metallicity, temperature, and gravity. And the reason is that because we have thousands of high signal noise ratio spectra available right now. And in fact, many brown dwarfs share overlapping temperature and gravity with exoplanets. And I think we want to mention and emphasize that brown dwarfs have similar TB profile and spectra with really irradiated gas giant planets too. So in this study, I want to focus um, with a one y 47 as an exoplanet analog. As you can see from the color magnitude diagram here, y 47 is much redder than the um, common um, L drop here. In fact, they have similar red color as many direct image planets too. And their similarity is more than that. From this like, one of the, um, observation from Mikkel, you can see that the black line is a spectra of Y047. First, you can see there's a much smaller arrow bar here that we see from brown dwarf compared to the uh, direct image planet. This is the hrit 799 e which is shown in the red arrow bar and a photometric observation in other wavelengths. So Y047 indeed show very similar striking spectra features as, HRIT, uh, as a direct image planet too. If you look at the mass and a different temperature difference, they are more or less the same. In fact, except for the gravity, which has, um, because of higher mass, Y047 has a slightly 0.5 to 1 order of magnitude larger gravity than the gas giant planet here. So, um, in the observation of our Clark Atlas survey, we found that this uh, Y047 has a s uh, one of the largest spectral modulation amplitude we've ever observed among L dwarf. You can see here uh, throughout the HST observation, nine hours observation, the blue point here shows that it has 10% peak-to-peak -peak variability amplitude. It's one of the largest we see um, in the L dwarf. And more interestingly, if you look at taking the spectra of the brightest and minimum ratio, you can see there's a strong trend wavelength dependency from 1.1 to 1.65 micron region. And you pay closer attention, you see that there's slightly lower variability amplitude in the water band. So how do we explain this? So in our study, our goal is to understand first, what is a cloud, vertical cloud structure to give such a dusty red atmosphere compared to other uh, common um, L dwarf? Secondly, which is a uh, key result of this result is that how, is the, how does the heterogeneous cloud explain the strong wavelength dependent spectral variability that we are seeing here? So in order to constrain the vertical cloud structure, there are two very uh, useful methods by having a time resource spectroscopy. So in, the, in this plot, it shows that by measuring the time series uh, flux variability, we can constrain the rotational asymmetric distribution in the atmosphere. This one, the illustration for one of the bender structure that we see in the um, Daniel's 2017 study. And also, we, from this school, we all learned that molecular opacity is highly wavelength dependent. So depending where the wavelength you're looking at, you are seeing a different, uh, different photosphere level. So they can be a very useful indirect pressure probe to predict different um, atmosphere region. So this, our, this is a flowchart of cloud modeling progress process. 
So due to a time constraint, I'll focus on how do we use the best fit equilibrium cloud model to construct a heterogeneous cloud model that can explain all the time, all the observation, including the red color, time rate spectra, and the spectral modulation that we see in the observation. So before moving to the heterogeneous cloud structure in this model, just to show you this a result, how, ex um, how well matched we can get from the model fit in a, with, by including a disequilibrium chemistry. So you can see that the blue point is the data, and the green point is the cloud model we have for homogeneous cloud that we can find that by including this equilibrium chemistry for this late L dwarf, we can explain very well the all the uh, spectral features from 0.75 to 2.5 micron. So we move on based on this equilibrium model, the best fit we get, we can move on to, uh, to uh, construct a heterogeneous cloud model. So the assumption we have for our cloud heterogeneous cloud model is that it should be a perturbation of the best fit homogeneous cloud model. So based on this assumption, we introduce another cloud, uh, column in our, uh, our self-consistent um, cloud model. So in this um, heterogeneous cloud model, first, we have a first, this is the best fit cloud model. They have a similar F set equal to one cloud opacity here, as you can see. And in the second column, we introduce that in some, there are some thin cloud that cover in the atmosphere. They have some truncated um, cloud opacity, maybe due to wind shear or some atmospheric dynamic uh, circulation. So I want to emphasize that this heterogeneous cloud model is not a, is not a ad hoc or it's not a post-processing of the atmosphere cloud structure. In fact, we did a self constant cloud model, which, which means that the thick cloud column and the thin cloud, they all share the same TP profile, which is very important because you need to have a very consistent, this, uh, this is the only physical uh, scenario that to give for such a heterogeneous atmosphere. And another observation, you can pay attention, if you see the uh, opacity here, you can see that because of the large particle size, the you know, dust opacity is fairly gray. So there's a from zero to 200 micron uh, wavelength region, they are more or less the same opacity. So what do we get by introducing this heterogeneous cloud model? We found that if you perturb the cloud down to around the photosphere level, around 1350 Kelvin, 1350 Kelvin region, not only that you give a well-matched, um, reasonably well-matched uh, spectra, except for this, we haven't accounted to with this equivalent cloud uh, chemistry here, and it also explains uh, all the spectral modulation in HST, and also in the sp um, also explain why we see a lower variability amplitude in Spitzer. And another thing you can see that it also shows a slightly dip in the water band variability. So by using this heterogeneous cloud model, we explain the, all the wavelength dependency in the HST um, observation, the lower variability in the water band, and why the HST why th and the lower variability uh, amplitude in the speed zero wavelength. We also found that if you put it like in a further, in a higher altitude, it doesn't give you this kind of um, lower water band variability because you will have a less li less water uh, extinction at the higher uh, altitude layer. So in conclusion, we first we show that by having such an extended vertical cloud structure and including this equilibrium chemistry, we can explain the unusually red dusty color of this Y047 um, object. And also, even though the things that we learn from doing, doing this exercise is that even though we see, we, even though the cloud is very um, gray opacity because they have a large grain size, if you have a th wearing cloud thickness um, in the atmosphere, then it will also give a very really strongly wavelength dependent spectral modulation because you are seeing different heat, different photosphere level in different cloud region. And also by, by, by using the, from the opacity uh, variability amplitude, we can also exclude the necessity to, to, uh, to the haze to expand this kind of like really, really uh, scattering like features here. So by using the heterogeneous cloud alone, we self consistently expand all the observation uh, that we see uh, in the HST and Spitzer and also explain the time average spectra uh, features. Thank you.
Yeah, that it would be good to uh, test uh, this hydrogen cloud model on all the variable brown to see how the what the what they call cloud structure at different temperature and gravity and how it affect. Uh, it could tell us that how the atmospheric circulation could affect the how much you put up a cloud level. And also, one interesting um, um, question that we can think about is that uh, we haven't studied how the rotation impact how the it dominate the cloud vertical structure here. So in principle, all the atmospheric circulation would be uh, important to perturb the cloud um, to give a heterogeneous atmosphere, which is the next, I think, which is the next important question we need to study. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, we um, in I should try to fit the wise uh, photometric broadband data, and we did find that by using the best fit model, it's also give a better explanation, give a better fit to the wise um, W3 and W4 band um, fo broadband photometry. So yeah. All right, so I'm very glad to talk about directly image planned again. Um, so I present some results that are due to a very huge team effort over the last two years that were able um, using the Gemini Planet Imager or GPI. So just a bit of context. So GPI is a extreme adaptive optic instrument that is mounted on the Gemini South Telescope. It was designed to reach very high contrast at small angular resolution, um, small, small angles to detect a self-luminous uh, giant planet around nearby young stars. So that's what we did. And actually, the universe is not very fair with us because we know that those planets are fairly rare. But still, we were able to study a couple of them. Um, so here is the, the family. Where is the laser? OK. So here's the family portrait that we observed uh, so far. So some of the planets were already known before. But with GPI, we were able to detect um, new planets. So for instance, 1500 b, which is a true Jupiter mass planet orbiting a A star at a thir um, 13 astronomical units. Um, so it's a fairly low mass. But as you can see from this family, the planets that we have been able to observe span a very large range of masses, from a few Jupiter masses up to several tens. So you might want to call them brown dwarfs. It's up to you. Uh, and they also span a very large range of uh, ages, so from few tens of million years old up to uh, several hundreds. So, they, so this family basically has a very large diversity. So we can study the properties of this atmosphere over a large range of parameters. So I can tell you that those planets are dusty. They are cloudy. So it's not obvious, actually, from the, from the images. So let's have a look at their photometric properties. So we've already seen this uh, color magnitude diagram, so everyone has its own. So here's J versus J minus K. On the left, it's a blue. On the right, it's red objects, hot and cold. Um, so here, the little circles are the field MLT sequence. The little stars are all known young uh, giant planet, uh, um, brown dwarfs. And the diamond are actually all the known directly imaged planets so far. And the ones that are labels are the ones that we studied with GPI. So as you can see, all the directly imaged planets, they fit onto the sequence of young and red brown dwarfs. So as we heard before, they share very, uh, very similar properties. And they are actually shifted compared to the sequence of field objects. So they are redder. So it means that they have a lower gravity or clouds. So this is true for the M and L sequence. And actually, it's also true for the T sequence. So as Benjamin told us, uh, it was thought that basically the clouds here were uh, basically below the photosphere. So we thought that those dwarfs uh, were cloud free. But actually, with the detection of 5200b, it's no longer true. There might be some sort of clouds up there in the photosphere. All right, but photometry is quite boring. Uh, so GPI is actually a very powerful instrument for characterization because it has an integral field spectrograph. 
So just to illustrate the uh, power of the instrument, so during commissioning, we uh, pointed at Neptune. So here is a 2D image, raw image of Neptune. So, and actually with the IFS for each single uh, pixel, we have a low resolution spectrum. So it means that during the data reduction process, we can reconstruct a data cube with the uh, image dimension in the X and Y axis and along the Z axis, we have the wavelength. So let's see, actually, let's go through the cube. So here's an, it's an H-band observation of Neptune. You have the wavelength on the lower left uh, bottom and basically you see that as we go through increasing wavelength, Neptune gets brighter and then boom, it's dark because we basically falls into the methane absorption band. So this is actually very powerful for characterization, but obviously for directly imaged planets, we do not resolve the planet, but still we can do the same thing. So here is a subsample of the planet. So actually the resolution of the is really bad. Uh, so you have basically to trust me. So again, <laughs> on the left, oh, here it is. Uh, on the left, you have the data cube edge band again. On the right, this is the corresponding spectrum of the planet. So here is 1500 B. So let's start at the, all right, let's wait a bit. Beginning of the edge band, the planet gets brighter and then boom, it vanishes because there is basically strong methane in the atmosphere of this planet. So as you can see for the other spectra, they are quite different. And actually one of the main goal of the GPI campaign was to build up a uniform spectral library of directly imaged planets. So basically here we do minimize the biases by using the same instrument, the same data reduction technique, and we can basically compare the spectra of those objects. So again, just to remind you, those are thermal emission spectra. So do not expect to see an emission band, an emission line. I don't understand those. We here expect absorption band. So we do see many molecules basically as a function of temperature. So hot, uh, top is hot object. And then down there in school objects, so we see water band, strong water absorption band, we see the CO band head around 2.3 micron. And as we go at very low temperature, we do see strong methane absorption band again. So we have a very nice diversity, so we can basically now do a uh, cross comparison of the object. And so we can start with some empirical comparisons. So Benjamin actually made, I think made the case uh, for which giant exoplanets and young brown dwarfs are very similar. So they have the same atmospheric properties. And so here you see basically the uh, best fit object for each single directly imaged planet. So for some cases, there it's almost impossible to distinguish between the spectra of the planet and the brown dwarfs. Um, for some of them, there are some discrepancies basically because we don't know enough T's to reproduce the spectra, the spectrum of fusion AB. So it means that by studying young feed brown dwarf for which it's much easier to get exquisite data, we can learn a lot about the, the atmospheres of those young giant planets. Okay, question. Yeah, that's why. Right. Yeah, yeah. You're correct, you're absolutely correct. And uh, so the colors might be different as well. Um, so just a bit of caution, so the library isn't complete yet because uh, we are able only to get a band at a time and for some objects, it's really hard actually to get the, uh, to get the data, especially here in J-band for which the blend are failure. Um, all right, uh, let's do some modeling. So here actually, I'm very glad to be here because I uh, was able basic to use uh, grids that exist in the literature that were made by people in this room, like Christian, like Marc. So I'm very glad they are here. So let's use their models. So let's start with the Drift Phoenix grid. So basically, as you can see here, this grid does a nice job at reproducing the spectrum, uh, but, they, s b but they, they do not work actually for feature B because actually there is a lower boundary on the, uh, on the grid at 1000 Kelvin. So this plant is too cool basically to be produced by the, uh, by the models. Um, so the fit is quite good, but if we look closely, there are some discrepancies. Like for this subject, the colors do not match. So maybe uh, this subject is very red, so there are maybe thicker clouds or different uh, processes. 
Uh, there are some mismatch uh, in the K-band as well. Um, all right, moving on with the another green. So the BT settle that were developed uh, nearby in Lyon. So they do a better job in the K-band, but actually if you look at the uh, predicted uh, surface gravity is very low. So this fit was done without any prior on the properties of the object. So then you can wonder whether these values are physical or not. Actually, the answer is no, because it it's way too low. Um, all right, and then moving to the Sonora family. So the Marley et al model, Marley et al model, Fortnite et al model. So actually this is the single grid that goes down enough, cool enough to be able to uh, do try to fit future on AB. So here in the public library, um, the model do not fit quite well the data, but actually Abirajan, who, who is a postdoc at STSCI and Mark, did a very nice job at tuning the model by changing the cloud composition and the patchiness of the, m uh, of the cloud coverage to improve the fit of the spectrum. Yes? Yeah, there is a said in addition. So I was basically, I, so I was comparing the main parameters from the different grids. So mainly, so because for th for a given grid model, there is maybe sometimes only two parameters that are available, which is the temperature and the gravity. So the purpose here was only to make a comparison between the different grids. But of course, yes, that do fit the model. Yeah, and the metallicity again. Yeah. It's true. Uh, yeah, it's true. We can go into the details, but I, it w I, w I was not <laughs> going to do that. Uh, all right, so here is basically a summary of the different uh, models comparison. So as you can see, there are, uh, so basically there is not a single grid that is able to nicely reproduce all the spectra uh, at a time. Uh, several objects are quite well reproduced by given models, but it's not the case for other objects, like this one, HD206A93B, which is actually extremely red. So we don't really understand what's going on, ex uh, especially because there is like some feature here, <laughs> um, or 1500B as well. So again, we have a very nice data set, so if you are developing new models, uh, please come to talk to us and we'll be able to test, basically, your work on our data. Um, all right, so this it was made uh, using forward models, but we, in the direct imaging, we are starting to use a retrieval. Uh, so here is a prelim preliminary work on one of the objects using Brewster. So Ben Sponingham, a uh, retrieval code for cloudy L drops. So here we basically, I think a forward model and the retrieval can be very helpful to trying to um, see if there is any systematic biases between the two approaches like with a different composition that, were not that was not considered into the foreign model grid. So here maybe there is some hint of a super solar c to ratio, of maybe super, metalli uh, super solar metallicity, different cloud structure. Uh, so I won't go into the detail of this plot, uh, but this is the kind of thing that we can do uh, in the direct imaging field as well. All right, I would just want to conclude here with this figure. Um, so we have two very nice uh, spectral library with hot Jupiters and with dark imaged planet. So they both have the same temperature range. So, okay, this one are uh, strongly uh, insulated, these are not, but I think we can learn a lot by comparing the two families, comparing the different models um, between the two, uh, the two uh, families of planet, basically. So I think we should basically work together much more than we do so far. All right, I will stop here and take any questions. Yeah, you, you raised a very nice point. Um, 
which is unfortunate but tr but real. Uh, so those data are not the ground truth, obviously. Uh, it's really hard actually to detect those planets and it's even harder basically to extract a high quality spectrum, uh, especially for these objects which are uh, very faint, uh, very close in, so we have contaminated by speckers. So they can be, they can have some um, discrepancies between the different instruments. So that's why having a uniform library do minimize the biases, so it's easier to compare the spectra with each other by using the same tools. But it's true that there might be some systematics that are not taken into account into this uh, spectra. Yeah. Yeah, we, yeah. Yeah, there are coalition as well, but they are taken into account in our approach. Uh, for the photometry, for photometry, but for uh, yeah, but usually <laughs> the those spectra from a uh, like high resolution spectrometer they are uh, ensured into photometric measurement made with uh, adaptive optic instruments, so they are not very well calibrated. So they, so it's hard to make the comparison. Oh, okay. Yeah, so uh, very interesting question. So um, for those who are not maybe familiar, a bit of context. So direct image planets, uh, we think they are formed uh, with a hot start, so they have a high entropy, so they are very luminous. But there is another case for which the planets start their life by being very faint. Um, so those are the two model family for evolution. Um, and actually with GPI, we have very low, very little sensitivity to the cold start planets. Uh, so we basically have very little constraint on the occurrence of planets if they are formed according to this scenario. Um, so we basically need a new instrument <laughs> to reach deeper contrast. Uh, yeah, 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 that'd be one. Thank you. Hello, everybody. So my name is Kazuma Saono. I'm a PhD, uh, second year of PhD students in Tokyo Institute of Technology. Today, I will talk about the uh, uh, mineral class of fluffy aggregates. Fluffy aggregates is like this complicated uh, non-spherical uh, particles. So <coughs> today, I will talk about talk that if we consider such uh, complicated stuff, it might be possible to explain some puzzling observations. So transmission spectrum surveys suggest that the many exoplanets ex exhibit the feature spectrum. This problem is uh, especially serious for the warm mean Neptunes. This figure shows the transmission spectra for uh, six warm mean Neptunes. So you can see that the uh, water feature around the 1.4 microns for upper two uh, warm mean Neptunes, but we cannot see the any spectral features uh, for lower four planets. 
usually is the interpretation of such feature spectra is the presence of a clouds in high altitudes. One of the candidates of the compositions of such high altitude clouds is a condensed mineral, so called mineral clouds, not dust clouds. So, <coughs> so according to the equilibrium chemistry, it is suggested that the <coughs> the vaporized, vaporized chloride potassium or maybe the zinc sulfide can be condensed into the uh, deep atmospheres uh, in the case of the warm mean Neptunes. <coughs> so, however, in order to explain the feature spectrum, we need to bring up that these uh, solid particles to high altitudes. <coughs> Sometimes it's possible, so as, uh, <coughs> as demonstrated by the Benjamin Shannon's work, so if the cloud is composed of the submicron particles, it is possible to bring up the such particles to uh, relatively high altitudes. <coughs> However, of course, the particle size also evolves with the height. So our previous studies uh, investigated the uh, particle growth during the vertical transport of cloud particles <coughs> and found that uh, <coughs> cloud height is sometimes uh, too low to explain the observations. This figure shows the maximum extent of the chloride potassium clouds uh, for GJ 1240B as a function of the mass metal, uh, mass metal mass fraction of atmosphere. So <coughs> glacialized regions, uh, glacial regions indicate the uh, cloud height suggested by the observations. And you can see that the, <coughs> the cloud height suggested by the microphysical model is one or two orders of magnitudes lower than the observation suggestions. This is simply because the particles grow into too large size. Such large particles cannot be lofted to high altitudes. Such a same kind, uh, same kind result is also obtained by the other studies using the karma. One of the promising ways to break such discrepancy between the microphysical model and observation may be the considerations of the microstructure of cloud particle itself. It is theoretically and experimentally known that suggested that the solid particles can grow into the fluffy aggregates like this uh, cute guys. So <coughs> because such uh, fluffy aggregates have the low settling velocity, so they should be lofted to more high altitudes as compared to the case of compact sphere. So maybe the such presence of the fluffy aggregates can explain the uh, ubiquity of the feature spectra. So the question is that how does the such fluffy aggregates evolve in the planetary atmospheres. So how does it affect the observable, spe observable spectrum? And uh, can fluffy aggregate indeed explain the uh, feature spectrum? In this talk, I aim to answer these questions. I briefly summarize the uh, uh, overview of our uh, cloud formation scenario. <coughs> First, the cloud is uh, formed in the deep atmosphere uh, via the, some kind of the nucleation stuff or condensation stuff. And then the solid particles might grow into the such fluffy aggregates due, uh, via material sticking, or maybe such aggregate also undergoes a compression process. And finally, such uh, aggregates uh, maybe the transported to high altitudes or maybe the settling into deep atmosphere. So basically, we calculate uh, uh, this stuff uh, by solving the double moment equations. Uh, <coughs> in other words, we calculate the transport equations of uh, particle number density and mass densities. Uh, by taking into account the uh, uh, growth of uh, growth due to microphysical process. So according to the Kirishian's lecture, uh, this number density and mass density are corresponding to the zero order and third order moments. <coughs> uh, in this study, the particle transport is driven by the gravitational settling and the, uh, the atmospheric motion, which is expressed by the LED diffusion parameterization. So in this study, we use the uh, uh, diffusion coefficient obtained by the GCM study of Benjamin Chinese work. <coughs> uh, however, unfortunately, the <coughs> nucleation process and condensation process is still highly uncertain for exoplanetary atmosphere. So <coughs> therefore, in this study, we parameterize that this uh, microphysical process by changing the size of monomer as a free parameter. Yes, uh, in, uh, so because the uh, cloud abundance is limited by the abundance of the condensing vapor, so <coughs> it means that if the monomer is small, then the, <coughs> the number density of monomer is high. <coughs> so <coughs> we calculate the cloud, form, the cloud formation process above where the such monomer formation is already finished. 
Simon and Tango City, we also calculate the equilibrium aggregate density at each altitude. <coughs> in this study, we take into account that this the density decreasing due to the poor formation via material sticking and the density increasing due to the compression uh, via the lamp pressure of gas lag. So we also examined whether the compression via high speed collision occurs or not, but we found that the in the planetary atmosphere, the collision velocity is too low to compress the aggregate. So <coughs> follow, following results does not include the such collision and compression. <coughs> this figure shows the equilibrium, equilibrium aggregate density as a function of aggregate radius. So vertical axis is a volume feeding ratio, which is uh, defined as uh, aggre aggregate density normalized by the material density. So we can see that in the initial stage of the aggregate growth, the aggregate density decreases with increasing aggregate radius because of the uh, poor formation. <coughs> However, once the aggregate radius, aggregate size uh, exceeds the threshold value, which is approximately about, about uh, 30 micron, the aggregate density increases with increasing aggregate radius. This figure shows the vertical distributions of the uh, characteristic aggregate radius, mass mixing ratio, cloud mass mixing ratio, and volume feeding ratio of aggregates. So dotted line shows the vertical distributions for compact sphere clouds and solid lines for uh, fluffy aggregate clouds. <coughs> As seen in this figure, so basically the fluffy aggregate, fluffy aggregates grow into the much large size as compared to the case of compact sphere particles because of the uh, large cross-section cross for same mass particles. However, simultaneously, the aggregate density also decreases with increasing size significantly. Therefore, the finally, the, <coughs> the vertical extent of the uh, fluffy aggregate cloud is much higher than the uh, clouds composed of the compact sphere. So the, in the context of the fluffy aggregate clouds, the high altitude clouds is composed of the uh, large aggregates made of small monomers. Next, we calculate the transmission spectrum using the cloud profiles calculated by our microphysical model. So for the calculations of the aggregated opacities, we apply the modified mean field theory, uh, which is recently proposed by Sasaki and Tanaka in uh, 2018. <coughs> so in this figure, uh, the, <coughs> the each line shows a, a spectra for cloud-free atmosphere, the spectra with the, for the atmosphere with compact sphere clouds, and the atmosphere for the atmosphere with the fluffy aggregate clouds. As seen in this figure, the sp shape of the transmission spectrum for fluffy aggregate, fluffy aggregate clouds is significantly different from the spectra for compact sphere clouds. Indeed, the fluffy aggregates uh, significantly reduce the gas absorption as compared to the case of compact sphere clouds. In addition, the fluffy aggregate clouds also produce the characteristic spectral slope, which is following the uh, dependencies of the lambda to minus two. It is interesting, because if you observe the spectral slope, which is uh, weaker than the Rayleigh slope, but uh, steeper than flat line, then it might indicate the presence of fluffy aggregates. Finally, so we compare the, our syn synthetic transmission spectrum with the uh, observations of gj 124 tb so we find that, so even if the, uh, even if we assume as we assume the presence of fluffy aggregate clouds, it is still difficult to, uh, it is still difficult to uh, explain the observations as long as the atmospheric metallicity is lower than about uh, 100 times solar metallicity. <coughs> uh, there are two reasons. One is that in the case of the low metallicity atmosphere, the cloud abundance is low, uh, too low to be optically thick at high altitudes. Therefore, the uh, clouds cannot mask the spectral feature. The another reason is that, the, as I said, the fluffy, aggregate, fluffy aggregate clouds produce a spectral, spectral slope, which is also inconsistent with the uh, flat spectrum of gj 124 tb especially for the uh, range of the uh, near infrared wavelengths. So we find that but, uh, our synthetic spectrum well matches the uh, observations of gj 124 tb if the atmospheric metallicity is higher than at least 100 times solar metallicity. <coughs> this is simply because uh, in the case of high metallicity atmosphere, the cloud abundance is high enough to be uh, optically thick at high altitudes. 
in editions. So as you know, the spectral slope, spectral slope uh, <coughs> approaches to the flat line as if the, uh, sorry, <coughs> the steepness of the spectral slope is proportional to the pressure scale height. <coughs> so in the case of high metallic atmosphere, pressure scale height is also small. It means that as uh, atmospheric metallicity increases, the so this spectral slope produced by fluffy aggregates uh, approaches to the flat line. <coughs> Therefore, <coughs> our results suggest that the uh, flat spectrum GJ1240B might indicate the presence of fluffy aggregate clouds in the highly metal enriched atmosphere. This is a summary of my talk. Thank you for attention. Yeah, it's a good question. No, not yet. <laughs> but uh, of course, I want to uh, try to do it. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so in this study, we assume the cloud is uh, the monomize made of the uh, pure cloud potassium, uh, pure cloud pot KCN. Yes, because the uh, KCN is one of the most dominant species in the uh, atmosphere of gj 124 b So basically, the, uh, accum the accumulation of the KCN molecules is uh, completed in the stage of the uh, monomer, fo monomer formation uh, in this stage. So, <coughs> so I'm, I'm not so sure the uh, complex structure of the molecules, but the <coughs> so we calculate the, in this study, we set the size of the, this uh, stuff as a three parameter and then, so we calculate how these uh, each cloud particles stick with each other and then how does they? Yeah? Uh, maybe you mean about, maybe you asking, <laughs> so, sorry, my English is not so good. <laughs> so maybe you asking the, what kind of the uh, shape of the aggregate is assumed, right? Uh, basically, so in this study, we assume the, uh, the <coughs> aggregate have the, if the compression is not occurred, then aggregate, uh, may, aggregate keeps the fractal dimension of two. This is because, uh, so in this study, we assume, we assume the, uh, collision uh, the collision between the cluster cluster is the dominant process. last video. This one? Okay. Yeah. Yes, uh, this mon yeah, <coughs> this text means, uh, uh, sorry, explanation is not so. In this figure, the each colored line shows the best fit spectrum for different atmospheric metallicity. So for each atmospheric metallicity, so we have the another free parameter, namely the monomer size. Uh, so <coughs> for example, in the case of the red line, so we fix the atmospheric metallicity as a solar metallicity, and we change the uh, monomer size, and then we, uh, we get the uh, best fit spectrum. <coughs> Such best, best fit spectrum is uh, plotted in this figure. Right. So 
Yeah. <coughs> in, actually, so I don't still examine, for example, if the, there are two comp if the if the cloud is made of the bimodal distribution like the gray absorber and Rayleigh scattering absorber, then it might be also possible to produce such the intermediate slope. But uh, I don't still examine whether such slope is indeed uh, happen or not. So maybe such interpretation is also possible. Just in my no knowledge, yeah, we expect that if the uh, condensation results in the solid particle, then the such material can produce a fluffy aggregate. Sorry, is it not answered for you, your question? <laughs> Thank you. Destruction. Um, in, in this calculation, we don't include uh, such, for example, fragmentation because, uh, as I said, uh, uh, <coughs> collision velocity is too low to, yeah. Please discuss later. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, just, I'm totally misunderstanding something. But you generate these particles, no? right? And then they float up, no? And then if you go from down the slope down, you have the oscillation of this thing. So there, mu there must mm -hmm. be some way of looking at it. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Maybe I'm um, <coughs> So basically, so in this calculation, we, we fix the number density of the uh, monomers. Uh, at the lower boundary, so then calculate the, uh, the upper flux uh, using the boundary conditions, and then <coughs> so calculate so by calculating these equations, the finally the uh, <coughs> finally the <coughs> structure is determined by the balance between the uh, eddy transport and sedimentation. Thanks.
So um, we've got a number of people that have come in working on projects around JavaScript in various formations and various frameworks like that um, to do with Scrum Labels. Um, so some of the preliminary tools we've been looking at is how to make the app work functionally in the JavaScript structure or the Java language primarily through the Scrum. And also then we'll go and find some inquiries to get an idea on how your bug <coughs> actually fits into the nature of the flow. So just some quick preliminary things. We've already had what we anticipate is quite a lengthy West Berlin examinator who told us about how this could actually be a test. And if you compare that to the East side, you can see quite marked country differences in different countries. And in particular, I think what's really interesting to note is that we have four regions that are quite broad. Each of these apps sort of will have a part and a part. We have this top flat, which we can get in our own country. Above that, we've got a few country based apps, but the breadth of apps are thousands of other apps. And then the upper atmosphere is just one app. So if you go and look at the most active Java apps, you can find that in the top right hand corner of the top flat. So the top flat is quite high quality for this one. So we see a lot of country differences. Looking at the equivalent results for the abundant shared water framework, we don't see that strong differences. So between the East one and the West one for water, there are some differences in the upper atmosphere, but we're not seeing orders of magnitude differences between them. So what this tells us from here, um, principally from looking at some of the assumptions that come from the transition sector models, is that the assumption that the water alignment is so much tighter in terms of formation is not particularly good. But the assumption that the temperature is the same may not necessarily hold. So I've been looking at designing this new flow model of what the transmission spectrum of the app could actually look like. And E1, as we are, is still in the playground.
space time, right? So for the transition time, we need it. So yes, just wanted to show you that this drawing there was in a big benchmark. Put the, the we have a little bit differences here, and that basically means the resolution. The Orion um, square is will be 300, right? Will be and one is a thousand. So you you see a little bit more, you know, wiggle in the window, right? And that's the point it is. And uh, I use uh, meter written by Paul Moriere in Belgium, and uh, it's not being published yet. So you will see me by now. And uh, but what I working for the guys in, a, in the transitional uh, group to actually calculate the CP structure and, you know, the bottom space, the scale height, and all other things. And I'm sure I'm working with Ben, Ben Lee, on uh, actually the extension process where we wanted to know what are the, uh, what are the you know, uh, transition structure things to, uh, and, and after that we wanted to actually calculate the etc. at the end to see how much will it change when we use the management into into the model, and that's something that, that we are working on. And we are taking three approaches. The first approach is the rough estimation by Olivier, uh, Olivier Deli, uh, 2017, and the second approach we are taking is the first order estimation uh, from the final scale from Kevin Haynes, 2015 paper. And the third approach that we are taking is we use uh, my own code, which is the new uh, physics system called Marvel. It's more than 1,000 reactions, so it's going to take a while to, to see the result from that, and probably we do that in another you know, cutout paper, so it's going to be, a, so we are doing this in the next couple of months with, with that guy, and that was it. Basically, what I was wondering about, you know, we have HST spectra for uh, people who work with Chris too. I mean, an arc second, a few arc seconds, and th that's you know photometrically very well calculated. So uh, it's better than one person. Oh. It's high signal to noise. It, it doesn't. We don't get the same contrast as you. So with deep uh, learning, we know we yeah, yeah, we know. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. So for the setting of transition in deep learning, we're using a white dwarf binary. Okay. So uh, So it's, it's a longer okay. discussion, but I was wondering about yeah. the yeah. general yeah. slope oh in yeah, the future. Uh, okay, because yeah. uh, maybe it would be useful. Maybe we could chat about HST spectra. We have a, oh, so a whole library of yeah. HST spectra, and some of them they are pushing closer and closer to the sun. Yeah. Yeah. Ifan has done and Ben okay, yeah, some of the high temporal spectroscopy with primary suppression, and I'm thinking maybe that could be. Maybe that could be something that could be enforced here in the Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
thinking, you know, I have best background, they all have some similar challenges. So maybe I would think a bit about it. I would point out to Gifan too. Maybe it's worth thinking about. Maybe we can find, you know, three, four, five objects that could be compared to something.
that's not my idea. I'm not doing any shitty deeds. Yeah, 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 yeah. All the good ones. Yeah,
Because it was like super steep. And you guys went the back way? Okay. Yeah, we like kept going over the mountain. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh, because you had scissors and No, you had scissors.
Hello. Okay, very good. Um, so welcome back from the coffee break. I hope everyone is awake at least for a little while before dinner. Um, I, I want to thank all of the speakers who have gone before me because I think that my job is much easier now with all of this, this background. I, I feel like I understand my own slides a lot better than I did on <laughs> Monday. Um, so what I'll be talking about today is observations of clouds in small planet atmospheres. And I want to be specific about what I mean about small planets. We throw this term around a lot, and to an outsider, often small means terrestrial. Uh, but for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to be focusing on planets in the sort of two to four Earth radius regime. Uh, this is the famous plot from B.J. Fulton showing the histogram of planet sizes from uh, planets discovered by Kepler. Um, and we can see that there are, at least for planets with orbital periods shorter than 100 days, there are these two big populations. Uh, one is most likely uh, terrestrial, rocky planets here that have lost any primordial hydrogen-helium envelope. Um, a gap sculpted by photoevaporation for short-period planets. And then all of these planets in here, so intermediate in size between the Earth and Neptune, where we have no solar system analog. So these are really exciting uh, to study. We haven't been able to explore them before. Um, and we expect that their atmospheres have a significant hydrogen-helium fraction, which is important uh, for the possibility of actually detecting features in their atmospheres with current facilities. Um, so just, just to give you a sense of what kind of atmospheric composition you might expect for these smaller planets, this is a theory result from Jonathan Fortney showing the expected envelope metallicity, so how enriched your atmosphere is by elements heavier than hydrogen and helium, as a function of planet mass. And the basic picture here is that you have a protoplanet that accretes a hydrogen-helium envelope from the disk, and then it can be impacted by icy planetesimals that enrich that envelope. The different colors correspond to different planetesimal sizes. And you can see for, so two to four Earth radius corresponds, you know, maybe to I don't know, call it 5 to 30 Earth masses, somewhere in there. And you can see that for planets in that mass range, you expect quite a bit of envelope enrichment, uh, which means that there's more stuff available to form clouds and hazes. So this has been talked about a little bit, but uh, I think Beethoven said you have to hear everything three times before you get it, so I'll repeat it. Um, this is a cartoon illustrating the way transmission spectroscopy works. So you have your planet passing in front of the star, and a tiny bit of the stellar flux can filter through the planet's atmosphere. And depending on what wavelength you look at, the atmosphere can be more or less opaque, depending on what it's made out of. So this is a toy model, assuming the atmosphere is made entirely out of water. And you can see that where you have a lot of absorption lines, the atmosphere gets really opaque, and so you observe a larger transit depth, the fraction of flux that is blocked by your planet. Uh, the amplitude of features in the transmission spectrum is sensitive to the size of the planet and the star, um, but also uh, the scale height of the atmosphere. So we're assuming the atmosphere is in hydrostatic equilibrium, so you have pressure up, balance, and gravity down. Um, and the scale height is proportional to the temperature uh, the mean molecular weight and the surface gravity of the planet. So for our best case scenario, a large planet around a small star uh, with a hot atmosphere, hydrogen dominated, so low mean molecular weight, and low surface gravity, the best case scenario is that the amplitude of these features is about a tenth of a percent. Um, so it's we have a hard job, and when we move to smaller planets, our job gets even harder. Uh, so another feature of transmission spectra is that they're very sensitive to clouds and haze. Uh, so this was a very prescient paper from Jonathan Fortney all the way back in 2005 when we had barely discovered any exoplanets at all. And he realized that with the geometry of a transmission spectrum where you're probing you know, through the planet's limb along a path length 2x, uh, the opacity, the effective opacity of condensates is... 35 to 90 times higher than it is for a direct view. So if looking at, you know, Z versus X. Um, and so we expect that transmission spectra will be very strongly shaped by condensates in the planet's atmospheres. Uh, so what does that do 
Uh, this is my very simple observer's picture of what happens if you put clouds in your atmosphere. Um, suppose your underlying transmission spectrum is something like this blue line. Your clouds will truncate the spectral features at the altitude of the cloud deck uh, because they're not, they're opaque to the stellar flux. And so your spectrum might turn out looking something more like that if you have high altitude clouds in your atmosphere. Uh, however, you can also get muted spectral features if you increase the mean molecular weight of your atmosphere. So your, your scale height is inversely proportional to mean molecular weight. So if your atmosphere is made out of water, uh, which has a mean molecular weight of 18, compared to hydrogen, molecular hydrogen, which has a mean molecular weight of two, you expect your spectral features to be nine times smaller. Um, and so you need very high precision data to distinguish between these two possibilities. Um, so yeah, small planets are really challenging to observe. The feature size is linearly proportional to planet radius. So Jupiter's radius is about 11 times that of Earth. Neptune's radius is about four times that of Earth. So you're talking about a two to three times smaller uh, amplitude of your spectral features, which corresponds to a four to nine times increase in the amount of observing time you need uh, to study the spectrum in equal detail. And so this is sort of the family portrait of small planets that are accessible with current facilities. Uh, if you work on this, every one of these names is familiar to you. Um, and I'm going to focus a lot today on GJ1214b, which we've already heard about. Um, but I wanted to just show it here in terms of signal to noise. So GJ1214b still is the absolute easiest planet in this size range to study. Um, and so I like to call it everybody's favorite uh, super Earth, or perhaps least favorite, depending on what you're interested in. Um, so everybody, so this is the picture of GJ1214b about five years ago, and everyone was observing this planet. So it's orbiting a small, bright M dwarf. It's really easy to study. Um, and this is the transmission spectrum from many, many, many different observations. Uh, too many to list all of them here on this slide. And you can see that the data are basically consistent with a flat line. Uh, so a solar composition cloud-free atmosphere, the orange line has been ruled out. Uh, but you could explain the data fairly well if you assume the atmosphere has a high mean molecular weight, so 100% water. Um, alternatively, there could also be clouds present in the atmosphere. So in spite of all of these observations, there was no way to tell the difference with this precision in your data. And so I sought out to break the degeneracy between those two interpretations. Um, and I used the Wide Field Camera 3 on Hubble. I want to just take one minute to explain uh, for the youngest people in the audience why WIFC 3 is so great. Um, so it is a near-infrared detector sensitive to uh, roughly 1.1 to 1.7 microns. So you have access to the water absorption bands that are present there. Um, and this is a raw spectrum, and it, you'll notice that it looks really different from a normal spectrum, and that's because we've scanned in the spatial direction over the course of the exposure, and what that allows you to do is do longer exposures before you read out. Um, one of the annoying features of Hubble is that it was designed to look at faint distant galaxies, not bright nearby stars. Um, and so the early observations you spent almost, you couldn't look at very bright stars. In many cases, they would saturate in the shortest possible exposure time, and so this lets us actually collect the photons that we need to make these really precise measurements. Um, and the data look great. So here is a, an example transit light curve. This one is for a hot Jupiter. Um, and you can see that the, the different colors correspond to different visits. And so we get very repeatable results from observation to observation. And we also reach the photon noise limit. So, so I would say that wide field camera three is state of the art for transmission spectroscopy today. OK, so going back to GJ1214b, um, we observed 15 transits of the planet um, and increased the precision of the near-infrared transmission spectrum by about a factor of 10. And we found that it is still flat. Um, but in this case, so flat that we, we were able to rule out all plausible high mean molecular weight compositions, even a pure CO2 composition. That's the red line there. Um, which has a mean molecular weight of 44. 
And so this result was exciting because it was the first time we definitively knew that clouds or haze must be present in a planet of this size. And so going back to some of the theory that we talked about earlier in the week, do we expect clouds to be forming in GJ1214b's atmosphere? And the answer is yes. Um, so these are temperature pressure profiles uh, compared to condensation curves. These are from Caroline Morley's 2015 paper. The TP profile for GJ1214b is shown in red. Um, and you can see that it intersects these condensation curves for zinc sulfide, potassium chloride. Uh, so we think these are plausible species that could be condensing in the atmosphere. Um, I would say if I have any one takeaway from, from the lectures this week is that, you know, far be it for me to guess whether the cloud decks are actually forming at that altitude or not. Um, but that gives us a feel for, you know, yes, we do expect condensation in this planet's atmosphere. Um, and so we, we, we also took a more um, agnostic approach about the physics and we said, okay, you know, let's just assume we have a very simple model um, where there's a gray cloud deck uh, with a fixed height and we explored what cloud deck altitude was required to fit the data for given atmosphere composition. So we assume the atmosphere was made out of hydrogen and helium and varying amounts of water vapor on the x-axis. And we found that no matter what the atmosphere is made out of, the cloud deck height has to be really, really high. So above about a tenth of a millibar at three sigma confidence. And for, for reference, Earth clouds are down here, 500 millibar or so. So this is, these are very, very exotic cloud species. Uh, Caroline Morley did some more physically motivated cloud models. Uh, one of them was using the Ackerman and Marley uh, cloud parameterization in which she explored different values of atmospheric metallicity um, and sedimentation rates. And she found that to make the spectrum as flat as what we observe, you have to have both very high metallicity and very, very small f -set. So your clouds are really s small particles and very lofted in the atmosphere. Uh, she also explored whether you could get a good fit to the spectrum using photochemical haze models. And so the idea here is that you have some methane in your atmosphere, presumably. And if that if methane can be photolyzed by UV radiation from the star and recombined into longer hydrocarbon chains, essentially soots um, that are opaque at, at very high altitudes. And so she found that for a very wide range of particle sizes, you could get a good fit to the spectrum, provided that a lot of your haze precursors actually do go into forming haze. This is just for fun. This is an aside to make sure everybody's awake. Um, <laughs> so, so this is from Ben Charnay's 2015 uh, GCM paper where he, he computed what color the planet would be if it had these different cloud or haze species in its atmosphere uh, for two different, so on the top he's showing if GJ1214b, a very red star, is doing the illumination or versus the sun. And these are really ugly. <laughs> I <laughs> like. I was I, I was once asked by a reporter what color the planet was, and I I, I just dodged the question because I didn't know. Um, but now I'm kind of glad I didn't know because I don't want to say you know olive green or. Um, but I, I would encourage all the theorists in the room if you ever compute an albedo spectrum, this is a really fun exercise to see what the planet actually looks like. Okay. All right. I want to fast forward about four years from the time the GJ1214b spectrum was measured. Um, and so we know that, you know, at least one of these super-Earth sub-Neptune planets has thick high-altitude clouds or hazes. Um, but what about the rest of them? And we, we, for a long time, had some trouble getting more telescope time because people said, well, you, you know, you measured the spectrum for GJ1214b. It's the flattest line in the history of Hubble. Why, why should we bother giving you more time? All these things are going to be cloudy. Um, but we chipped away at it, chipped away at it, um, and now have a sample of about half a dozen of these small, uh, cooler planets compared to hot Jupiters. And we see that, no, not all of the planets do have such high altitude clouds. So I'm showing here the spectra normalized by the atmospheric scale height. So that this these are all on the same scale here. GJ1214b is flat as a pancake. 
you can't see the error bars there. Um, but then you can see there's actually a whole range of feature amplitudes all the way up to hat B26B, which has a very nice water feature. So Ian and I, Ian Crossfield and I, in true astronomer fashion said, okay, we now have a sample size of six. That's time to start doing a demographic study. Um, and we found that, you know, there are a few possible correlations that were interesting. So this is the, the amplitude of the water feature on the left here shown as a fraction of the, uh, as a function of the hydrogen helium mass fraction. So we're finding that planets with more hydrogen helium tend to have larger water features and that may be due to a mean molecular weight effect. Although as we've shown for GJ1214b, that spectrum is so flat that even the highest mean molecular weight still can't explain the data. Um, and on the right, we also see a, a reasonable correlation uh, with the planet's equilibrium temperature. So hotter planets tend to have larger features. Now, that's, that's physically interesting. Um, we expect that there, you know, there are more things that can condense at lower temperatures. There also may be sort of a phase change happening right around at 800 Kelvin because that's the temperature when uh, you change your dominant carrier of carbon from methane to CO and CO2. And as I just mentioned, methane is really good at producing these photochemical hazes. So it's possible that rather than fitting a, a slope to this, it's more of a step function than planets with abundant methane have very hazy atmospheres and planets without methane do not. Question? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know off the top of my head. So, oh, so we were, so the, the water feature amplitude that we're showing has been normalized for the planet's surface gravity. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah, we only have six points. Yeah, so, <laughs> so <laughs> no, 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 and this is, in fact, this is something that I've looked into um, fairly extensively where searching for trends with surface gravity and we, we don't find any. Um, so, you know, we, we acknowledge that there's only six points on these plots. Um, and so we want a bigger sample. And so Ian and I are, are co-PIs of a large HST program to observe four additional sub-Neptunes uh, recently discovered by K2. Uh, so we're, we're th that program is ongoing and we're excited to see what comes out. Um, oh, this is fun. Okay, so how, how am I doing on time? It's fine, okay, I'll keep going. Um, so, okay. This is a transmission spectrum for WASP-107b. Uh, WASP-107b is a very strange planet. It's famous recently for having a detection of helium um, in its exosphere, but that's not what I'm talking about today. Uh, so this planet is about two times the mass of Neptune, 38 Earth masses, so it's a little bit larger than the other planets I've been talking about. Um, it has a very inflated radius, so it's almost Jupiter in radius. Um, and it's close to this transition temperature where methane is abundant or not, around 800 Kelvin. And so we observed the spectrum with WIPC3 and found a very, very nice water feature. And the first question I asked myself was, oh, you know, how does this compare to the trend that we found for our other six planets? Does anybody want to guess? I heard different. It's high? Bigger feature? Any more guesses? No, everyone's hungry. Okay. Um, here it is. Uh, it is <laughs> right here. And we that is not a fit to that point, actually. We just superimposed it right on that plot. I couldn't believe this. Uh, so, so for now, we added one more point. The, the trend still holds. Yeah. So it's larger radius, but not that much larger mass. It's really inflated. Yeah. Okay, um, I want to share some exciting preliminary results. Please don't tweet about these. I will get in really big trouble. Um, so this is the transmission spectrum of GJ347dB. This is a 12 Earth mass planet, um, the equilibrium temperature of 7, 800 Kelvin. And this planet has been very extensively observed. I think this is the largest data set for any single planet since GJ1214b. Uh, the radius is about four Earth radii, so it's really puffy, yeah. 
Um, and so Bjorn Beneke led Hubble observations where he detected a very nice water feature in the near infrared. It's zoomed in on the right. The amplitude of the water feature is lower than one would expect for a cloud-free atmosphere, so in keeping with our picture of these other small planets. Um, what's really interesting is that we see this offset. So I, so I decided that this was a really exciting planet as well and proposed for Spitzer time because, as we've heard this week, um, there's a lot of interesting stuff happening as you go farther into the infrared, the optical properties of your cloud and haze particles is it changes as you go to these longer wavelengths. Um, and so the Spitzer points are from, from my program, and you can see a distinct offset between the Hubble data and the Spitzer data. And the interpretation of this that we've arrived at, this is still under review, is that there is evidence for me scattering with a particle size of about half a micron. Um, and that's what's giving us the best fits to this truncated feature in the near infrared versus bigger features in the infrared. Yeah, this is water. Yeah, it's really compressed to fit on there. That's water, though. Oh, at 4.5 microns. That is, yeah, I think that's CO. Yeah. Um, the, and the other, so in this, we also observed, uh, this is data from Heather Knudsen, the thermal emission spectrum of the planet. And this is very strange. So the planet is really bright at 3.6 microns and invisible at 4.5 microns. And the interpretation here is that methane has to be very depleted in the planet's atmosphere. Methane is a strong absorber at 3.6 microns, so if it were present, the planet would look a lot fainter there. Um, so this is, this is really interesting. There's a, there's a lot of physics and chemistry going on. One, you know, one potential feature of this data set is that if the planet really is methane depleted, then you don't have a mechanism for producing these soot hazes. And so perhaps that's why we're seeing a water feature in this one and not some of the others. Um, so I think this is the re really, re really exciting work and merits a lot of theoretical interpretation. This is just a first stab in interpreting what we see. Okay. so. Because this is a, a school, in the spirit of a school, I want to focus on the youngest people in the room and talk about what, uh, what exciting directions we can go in from here. Because as you can see, we've just barely started being able to observe the atmospheres of these small planets, and already we've seen evidence for a lot of interesting physics and chemistry. So the first direction we're going is towards a larger and more diverse sample of planets. So there are abundant surveys, both from the ground and from space, that are dedicated to finding planets transiting the brightest stars. Uh, really excited that TESS just launched. The first planet candidates are already out. It's working great. Uh, and so TESS will survey the entire sky and is expected to clean up on, the, on these short period small planets around bright stars that are the best targets for atmosphere characterization. <coughs> And what this will allow us to do is, you know, you've seen that the data for these exoplanets is not anything close to what we'll we have for the solar system and never will be. But the advantage of exoplanets is that we have a large sample size. And so by studying the cloud properties over a wide range of planet masses, radii, orbital periods, insulation, uh, UV irradiation from the star, stellar spectral type, that will hopefully give us a better understanding of the population of these planets and what their clouds and hazes are like. Uh, this is shameless advocating of my own work. Um, so, so this and also to give you a feel of what kinds of planets we'll be able to get good spectra for now that TESS has launched. Um, so this is showing planet size as a function of the irradiation experiences relative to Earth. And all of the previously observed planets are shown with these gray dots, and you can see that most of them are large and hot, so hot Jupiters. I know I've shown you today a handful of these smaller and cooler planets. But with a reasonable amount of Hubble time, this is corresponding to what we expect from a roughly 200 orbit program, you can get these, these green diamonds and observe a sample of about a dozen additional small planets that are much, much more representative of the overall planet population. 
Um, so fingers crossed that this pro proposal gets approved. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a target of opportunity. High risk, high reward. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> thanks. Um, <laughs> yeah, dream big. Um, and speaking of dream dreaming big, um, we another really big thing that we're looking for forward to all of us is the James Webb Space Telescope that will enable observation of these planets over a much broader wavelength range that has than has been accessible previously. We can do spectroscopy all the way out to 12 microns. Um, and so as so this is a figure from Caroline Morley showing predicted constraints on the thermal emission spectrum of GJ 1214b based on about half a dozen near cam eclipses. Um, and she showed that with data like this, we can start to distinguish between her different hypotheses for the nature of the condensate, so clouds versus haze. Another really interesting direction to go in is studying condensate formation in the lab. And I think one of my other conclusions from this week is that this is really, really important because the physical processes going on are so complicated uh, that it's great to be able to actually test what's going on uh, in for, for real. Um, and we're, we're going to hear a lot more about this in Veronique's talk after mine, so I won't belabor the point too much. Uh, but here's a result from Sarah Hurst, where she built a cloud chamber, put gas in it, simulated UV radiation to see what kinds of condensates formed uh, for a, a variety of temperatures and a variety of gas metallicities. And she found that condensates were forming all over the place, and the amount that f is formed depends strongly on um, the temperature, the composition of the gas. And so I think this is, this is just the beginning of a really exciting area of lab research. I'll leave the rest for Veronique. And finally, there is a ton of work to be done on the modeling side. So I, this is um, a figure from... Ono and Okuzumi uh, that we just heard about in the last talk, um, showing the different time scales and pressure levels for important microphysical processes. So you can see that we care about orders of magnitude differences in time scale and pressure level. We also care about the large scale atmospheric circulation, large temperature differences between day and night side. Um, so this is a really, really, really hard problem. Um, and I think that it's the job of all of us in this room to figure this out. So hopefully, at, you know, at Cloud Academy 2.0 in 20 years, we can do, we can do better than this. Um, and so I'll I'll leave up rather than my conclusions. I'll leave up my next steps. Um, happy to take questions. Oh yeah, it's because it's brand new. <laughs> I I don't know if I don't know where it fits yet. It looks the same. Oh, so the the emission. Well. Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, I don't know how the precision for GJ436B compares. I actually also have Spitzer data for GJ436B that I should analyze. So I'll get back to you on that. Yeah, that's our interpretation right now. Oh, so maybe, yeah, um, I mean, the carbon has to be somewhere. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know, I didn't do the modeling, but I, the, the best fits had a subsolar C to O ratio and required some kind of um, opacity dependent, or wavelength dependent cloud opacity. It could, you couldn't, I in other words, you couldn't explain this by composition alone.
Yeah. I can show you the plot after this. Yeah, it's it turned out that um, the 3 to 5 micron window was actually more informative for this particular planet based on the temperature that we expect and the brightness of the star. Yeah, the stars are just so faint out at miri wavelengths that you have to really observe a lot of transits even with JWST to start differentiating between these models. Is it good? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So thank you for the nice introduction to laboratory experiments. Um, I will start with Titan, though. And um, I was thinking maybe not all of you would be super familiar with Titan. So I would start with like a brief overview of uh, Titan's atmosphere. So um, it's very different from the exoplanets. It's cold. Uh, it's essentially, well, 90K at the surface, and the temperature range is like about 70K to uh, 150 or 200K uh, at the stratopause. Um, the pressure is sort of high for a terrestrial planet, or I mean, it's 1.5 bar at the surface, but the atmosphere is super extended. And then when you get to the exobase, it's about like 10 to the minus 8 Pascal. Um, so the main composition is nitrogen with a few percent methane. And you have this, uh, all these different energy sources. So ions and electrons from the magnetosphere of Saturn and sunlight. And the uh, GCRs that are being deposited um, very close to the surface. And uh, all this is like initiating this uh, very exciting chemistry. Um, essentially some ion, some ion chemistry in the upper atmosphere. And then when you move down, you're gonna get some more like radical neutral chemistry. And all this chemistry is going to make these, you know, aerosols, these photochemical aerosols that I will try to be calling haze in the future. And uh, then you uh, have all these uh, haze layers that are forming and all these guys fall down and eventually they can serve as condensation nuclei uh, at the cold point here, where these, uh, all these uh, gases can condense on top of the aerosols and uh, everything is finally going to fall down and end up on the surface. So as I said, I will try to stick to the definition of haze for the photochemical aerosols and the uh, ices or uh, clouds for the condensation aerosols. Um, okay, um, so essentially the outline of my talk will be the following. So I'm going to try to um, give you some background on the uh, haze of um, titans and move on to the laboratory analogs and talk to you about their uh, composition and properties. And then I will do the same thing for the clouds. And when I will be done with all this, I will briefly move on to uh, some exoplanets experiments that we already heard a little bit about. Okay, so there is some optical evidence for haze on Titan. We essentially already knew it from Voyager, but now with Cassini, we got some much better data. And essentially this uh, 
observations are like uh, stellar or solar occultations. And uh, you can see in the UV, we have like this uh, different uh, haze layer. If you look uh, in the near UV where you don't have any other gaseous absorber. And there are also these uh, 3.5 micron band that's observed. And that's like um, attributed to some uh, CH bonds in the uh, aliphatic hydrocarbons. So uh, that's for the, for the spectroscopic part, but there is also some uh, in situ measurements because Cassini was in orbit around Saturn, but about once a month, it was like flying through the upper atmosphere of Titan and it would collect the gas on whatever was present there. And um, this um, uh, instrument collected some like uh, particles and analyzed the mass. And you can see that we get some ions that are like have these masses up to like uh, 10,000 AMU. So that's at the very top of the atmosphere, around 1,200 kilometers. So that's really high up. And uh, I think Laura had the question about size on Monday. So I was trying to uh, illustrate that because so essentially if you have like a benzene ring, so that's a mass of uh, 78 down here. If you want to have like uh, molecules that would look like this like 1000 AMU mass, that would be like this sort of thing. So of course it's just a cartoon. I mean, I'm not saying that's what it is on Titan. It's just to illustrate like the type of molecules you would get. And this molecule, or I mean this macromolecule or whatever you want to call it, as would have a size of about three nanometers. So you can imagine when you have like uh, something that's like one micron, how big that would have to be. Um, and the other point I wanted to make is that there was this other in situ measurements from the Huygens probe. So the Huygens probe, it landed on Titan and it made some measurements when it was like uh, descending in the atmosphere. And it also collected the aerosols like very close to the surface in this case. And essentially it uh, burned up everything and analyzed the gases that were coming out. And it found that it was ammonia and HCN, which is not such a big surprise when you start with uh, something that's nitrogen and methane, it's not very informative. So essentially what I want you to learn from this slide is that, okay, we have some evidence from like aerosols all the way up to the top of the atmosphere, but essentially we have no idea of what the composition is, like the chemical composition, the instruments weren't made to really analyze that. So, I mean, there have been some microphysical models to try to understand the aerosol growth. So essentially now the understanding is that, okay, the chemical growth starts really in the upper atmosphere, in this ionospheric layer. So there you have like um, positive ions that are formed by ionization of nitrogen and methane. And you also have some uh, negative ions. So these molecules, they will attach electrons and become negatively charged. And because you have these both positive and negative ions, they will react with each other very efficiently and start like forming these macromolecules that we saw in the previous slide. And then, so that's basically the first step. But then when the altitude decreases this way, so these uh, monomers, they will start sticking with each other to form these uh, fluffy particles. Um, and then as you go down, there will be some further chemistry and these guys will start adding some gas phase species. And this will go to like, uh, again, a more round phase when you get close to the surface. So um, I would say like, like the physics of these processes are pretty well understood, but again, we know nothing about the chemistry. Like we don't know what like these molecules are. In this case, it's pHs, but it could be just anything else. So essentially, neither observation nor models can tell us what the chemical composition of these particles are. And that's why we turn toward laboratory experiments, because essentially that's the only way we can really get some insight on the chemical composition of that stuff. So laboratory experiments, so they started a long time ago, essentially for the early Earth with the Miller array experiment. But then Carl Sagan started doing that also for planetary atmospheres. And he decided to call whatever he was finding, Tholins. 
which which is from the Greek solos, which means like muddy or unclear because he didn't know what he was looking at. <laughs> so essentially, the goal of this experiment is to uh, mimic one or several of the energy sources that are capable of generating radicals or ions or any activated species. So essentially, on this uh, table, you can see all the different types of energetic stuff that can happen on Titan and all different laboratory experiments or energy sources that were used to try to simulate all these processes. So it's something that's very rich in the literature. I mean, there are like maybe hundreds of papers about like, you know, making this stuff and analyzing them. So essentially, like, whatever you do is you take like a gas mixture. So if it's Titan, you put nitrogen, methane, maybe CO. Um, you run it through like uh, uh, an experiment and you put like a discharge or whatever you want. And then you're going to form like these kind of like particles that are like orange, like Titan. So it's a good sign. <laughs> but uh, And essentially you do whatever you want with it. So some people have been analyzing those uh, physical properties, like their solubility, for example, in methane or ethane to see if they would be soluble in the lakes or this kind of stuff. Um, they analyze, of course, the optical properties, which is something you are very interested in. Um, they also analyze the chemical composition to try to really understand what you are looking at. Uh, especially they look for uh, prebiotic molecules. I'm going to go back to that in a minute. And they also looked at their reactivity to see what would happen if you again, like put them in some liquid water or something and see what happens. And that's all for like uh, exobiology type of related studies. So uh, before showing you the results, I want to show like a caution slide because there are a lot of challenges in producing this uh, solvent. Um, the first thing is that, of course, you want to have enough material for analysis and you don't want to be waiting for a thousand years. So uh, you definitely have to uh, do something about it. So usually people tend to have like a, a power density or pressure or mixing ratios that are much higher than like the, what you find in the planetary atmosphere. Um, to give you an example, 24 hours of exposure to a cold plasma discharge correspond to 1,000 years of irradiation by magnetospheric electrons. Um, the problem is that, that if you have like a, a dose of energy that's much higher than reality, you can have like secondary photolysis and secondary processes that will not happen in the real atmosphere. Um, the second problem is that if you want to replicate what's happening, for example, at 700 kilometers, uh, the mean free path there is 20 centimeters, so it's like this much, which is about the size of your lab experiment, right? So if you do that, essentially you don't do any gas phase reaction. You're just sticking everything on the walls, and I'm going to get back to that in a minute, and then you're not going to make anything that's at all realistic. So you have to increase the pressure. The problem is by increasing the pressure, then you have more collisions, and uh, the... Um, the, your active species, like the electrons and everything, they uh, won't be necessarily the, in the same state. So you're changing also like the chemistry. Um, another problem is the temperature. Um, it's hard to work at cryogenic temperature. So most of the experiments, they are done at room temperature. Um, and temperature affects the rate coefficients of the reaction. So if you work at to high temperature, you're going to change that again. And um, in the other hand, if you work at low temperature and you have like a high pressure, then you might have some gases that will start condensing, which is not what you want to do because you want to be in the gas phase. So there are lots of problems like that are like, you know, involved with this. And all this is related again to the wall effects that most of these films, at the exception of one experiment, they are done like as thin films and they essentially, at least at the beginning of the growth, will be catalyzed by like the wall of the reactor. After a few monolayers, you will be on like some aerosol particles, so then it will be more representative, but at least at the beginning, it's not what you will find in the atmosphere. And the last thing is that we are on 
a planet that is full of oxygen, full of O2, full of water, and it's really hard to work with experiments where you want to be Titan-like, where there is like 50 ppm of CO. So it's very difficult, it's very challenging to get rid of all this oxygen. And sometimes there is a lot of contamination from oxygen or water in the experiments. So all this being said, <laughs> Um, I'm going to show you some results. So that's like just one type of data that we can get. Uh, it's totally biased because that's what I'm doing. Um, so basically, um, I want to um, just emphasize that, uh, well, if you have like a high resolution mass spectrometer, not like those that are present on Cassini, and you can really uh, uh, measure the exact mass of the molecules, then you can give a molecular formula to all the molecules that are present in your sample, and in this case, your aerosol. So um, here you have like a typical mass spectrum of a solid. So you can see that it's very dense. If you zoom in one of these like groups, you can see that you get this. And if you zoom in on the nominal mass, you get like maybe 10 peaks. And each single peak corresponds to a molecule. So you can imagine the number of molecules that are present in there. It's maybe like 10,000 or something. So it's very complicated. So, okay, you can go and see what are the molecules that are present in your sample. So what's one thing that's interesting to go and look after is some prebiotic molecules. For example, can we form like prebiotic molecules in this aerosol? And that's an argument I haven't heard so far, I think, that, you know, aerosols, okay, they get in the way, they mess up everything but they can also be a source of prebiotic molecules. And that's something we don't want to rule out because that's something interesting if you want to go search for life or biosignature. So essentially that was for um, some uh, Titan samples and we did found some uh, biological amino acids and nucleic bases, which means again that, you know, these guys can be, can be important for exoplanets. Um, Another thing that I want to highlight is that because we have all this uh, attribution of all these molecules, we can really get into some like really deep insight of the chemical composition and the molecular growth. So for example, here I'm just trying to highlight that all these molecules, they are families, they are related to each other. It's a polymerization process. And uh, so you can really get some understanding about that. And the last thing is that um, we can really differentiate samples. For example, in this case down here, uh, this is some representation of the nitrogen to carbon and hydrogen to carbon ratio for two different samples, the solid and the HCN polymers. And if you look at the infrared spectrum of these two things, it's just exactly the same thing. But if you look at the mass spec data, you can see that all these points, they are like uh, different molecules and they don't look the same at all. All right. So now going back to the optical properties um, and trying to compare them to what we know about Titan. So essentially here, all these colored lines, uh, they are uh, lab experiments. So that's the uh, optical properties of tholins. Um, this dotted line here is the Titan observations. Here in this case, the Titan observation are this uh, thick solid line and that's the same here. So when you look at these graphs, one thing you can see is that there are very different absorption spectra among the various solids. So they all give you like very different answers. However, one common feature that we have already heard during the week is that they are all dark in the ultraviolet and relatively bright in the visible and the near infrared. Um, there is this uh, prominent absorption feature at 3.4 micron that's essentially not present in the solids. And there is also this increase in the haze optical depths here that's again not present in any of the solids. So another message here is that there are no solids on Titan. <laughs> huh. So essentially they are really useful in uh, teaching us of how to think of all this chemistry, but um, it really shouldn't be taken out of context. You're not really replicating Titan in the lab, that's sure. And you're not going to replicate an exoplanet in the lab either. 
okay, so now I'm, I'm probably very long, I'm guessing. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so, well, just a quick word about clouds now, because I've only been talking about haze. So, essentially, the message here is there are uh, many different types of clouds on Titan. So, by clouds, I mean this condensation of these uh, gases uh, in the lower atmosphere. So, now we are not in the upper atmosphere anymore. We are very close to the surface. And, uh, essentially, we have some uh, methane and ethane clouds and some nitrile clouds, some unidentified features clouds, and everything is like, you know, time dependent. Essentially, um, it depends on the season because some of the clouds were seen like um, at the North Pole when it was winter there, but then when it became winter in the South Pole, they switched. So they are only going to be located at some specific locations. They are not like around the full planet and they might switch in time. So complicated. Um, okay, another complication here is that, of course, when you have this uh, your aerosol particle, so this uh, photochemical haze that is going to fall down in the atmosphere, depending on the vapor pressure of all these different gases, they are going to condense at a different altitude. So essentially, you are going to have, like, depending on the altitude, like uh, some different layers of all these different gases that are going to form. And that's going to depend a lot on the temperature. So that might be different depending if you're looking at the equator, if you're looking at the pole, if it's summer or if it's winter there. So lots of complication. And another thing that may happen, and I'm going to show you that on the next slide, is that all these things may evolve photochemically because you still have light down there. So all this could evolve. So there are some people that have been doing experiments on that again. So in this case, you're no longer in the gas phase. You're like in the solid phase. So essentially, you, you spray some relevant gases on the window. So it's very cold, the window. So you form ices, like what you would get in the atmosphere, and you irradiate that with a UV lamp. And what you can see here, so in this case, they start from uh, acrylonitrile, C2H3CN, and you can see that they see the formation of some other species. You even get to the formation of some like residue that's more like tholin-like. So that's gonna be like uh, something that's uh, going to stay, for example, on the window if you heat it up. So that's again another way of forming some very complex material. So you can see that it's another extra layer of, com of complexity because once you have formed your uh, condensates, they will evolve again further with UV photons. Okay, so now I'm moving to extrasolar planets. So I was trying to um, summarize what I think we can do in the lab, like, uh, you know, with, uh, with lab experiments that would be relevant to uh, extrasolar planets. So one of the things, and that's uh, really relevant to Sarah Earth's work that I'm going to talk about later, um, so we may want to decide or at least get some clues on which are the atmospheric temperature and composition that are favorable for S formation or for prebiotic molecule formations. And that's to guide all these future explorations because you guys will have to pick some of these exoplanets. And, you know, I think it's going to be interesting to know <laughs> which ones you want to go after. And that maybe be a, a good hint of what are these planets. Um, of course, we want to know a lot about the chemical processes. Maybe it's not so interesting for you, but me as a chemist, I'm really interested in knowing how all these different gases can evolve and what they can form, and if we can see some, you know, connection between the gas phase and the particle composition. And I think for you now, it's going to be very difficult to go after the particle composition, but maybe if we can relate that to some very particular species in the gas phase, maybe it's going to be very easy for you to try to look at this particular gas phase picture. And of course, something that, of course, you're all interested in is to get all the optical properties for all these different hazes so that you can put that in your models and try to, uh, you know, have uh, something that's more representative than what maybe you have now. Okay, so um, going back to um, to this work that we already heard about. So that's like the 
essentially the lab setup that's been developed by uh, Sarah Hurst at Johns Hopkins. So what she has been trying to do over the past two years, I think, is to um, essentially mimic all the possible composition of super Earth and mini Neptunes uh, from chemical equilibrium models. So essentially that's the composition you have from uh, chemical equilibrium models for different metallicities and different temperature. And that's what she used as a starting gas mixture. And so she irradiated these gases with both plasma, I mean, as separate experiments, but it's either plasma or UV to try to see the influence of uh, the type of irradiation you have. And uh, what they got, so that's uh, uh, images of um, these um, particles they got for all these uh, nine different experiments. I think in this case, it's for the plasma experiments. So you can see that for all the different uh, experiments, they did find some particles. Um, and one of the interesting results here, okay, I forgot to say something here. So essentially, maybe you guys already know that, but for me, it was interesting to realize that here it's only hydrogen dominated. Here it's essentially water dominated. And here it's essentially CO2 dominated. Um, so essentially you can see that, so this was essentially methane dominated and this was essentially CO2 dominated. And you can see that even for the CO2 dominated ones, there are still some particles that are formed. And I think that's been like some kind of debate in the early earth community saying that you needed really methane to produce hazes and that it wouldn't work out if you had CO2. Well, it maybe it doesn't work out as well, but it does work, at least for this one, it works really well. And uh, oh yeah, I didn't say, but down here is Titan, just to give you a comparison. Um, and they measured the particle size distribution. So um, they all got like uh, similar size ranges for all their experiments. So between 10 to 200 nanometers. So here with maybe a bias of the experiment, then essentially it's always the same flow rate and it's always the same pressure. So this might really drive these particle sizes and not something that's really physical and that would be more related to the atmosphere. But nevertheless, I mean, the, the particle size range is different for all these different uh, gas mixtures. And uh, um, so there is maybe something to learn from here. Um, now this slide that we already saw, and you can see that, um, well, we have this uh, particle production rate, so that for the plasma, and that's from the UV. Um, so it's not the same units, but uh, essentially that's the total, and that's per hour, and they irradiate their uh, mixture for like 72 hours. So essentially the conclusion is that the plasma works much better than the UV which is something we already know from Titan. But here you can see that for these two different gas mixtures, we have like a lot of particle formation. And that's similar to Titan, which is this gray line here. Um, so essentially, well, we al you already know that from the observations, but now there is really proof from the lab that you really do expect to form aerosols in this type of atmospheres. Um, okay. So they also looked at the particle color, and you can see that they are all different from the different types of uh, experiments. They haven't done optical properties yet, but I know they are working on it. And the last slide I want to show you, it's this different group that's been uh, looking at um, optical properties for different CO2 to methane ratio. So that's a paper that was really like related to the early Earth atmosphere, but I think it's maybe also interesting for this community. So essentially you can see that the optical properties, they really change with this uh, CO2 to methane ratio. Um, essentially when you have uh, this more oxidizing plasma, uh, the absorption switches to the UV here, that's the pink line, and it's also um, more absorbent. So, and they have also this uh, new band when you have like uh, CO2, so maybe if you have like a, you know, planet that's more CO2 rich than CO4, maybe, you know, these uh, optical properties are interesting to use. 
Okay, so my conclusions. Um, so I hope I convinced you that laboratory um, analogs are currently the best way to get some insight into uh, this uh, complex uh, extraterrestrial organic matter. Um, although the experiments are becoming more and more relevant, they are still not very represent not fully representative of uh, this uh, planetary atmosphere, and they should really be used as guides and not taken as like the ground truth. Um, they, I mean, what we already know, but um, all this is extremely complex, so there is really a whole lot of processes that have to be taken into account, and. Uh, Hopefully now, even in the solar system, there will be some new um, space instruments that will give us some new information. And uh, maybe you guys can learn about that, and there is still a lot to be done in the solar system. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, it's not too bad. Well, there are a lot of experiments that were done for the early Earth, but of course it doesn't really help us because it's like, I mean, all the, most of the, um, I mean, I'm not super familiar with that field, but I think, th yes, I mean, it's not, most of the uh, hazes in the Earth are actually biogenic, you know, or you do form something in the liquid phase with like, uh, you know, that's based on water, and it's very oxidized, so I think it's a very different process. So I'm not familiar with the, this type of uh, experiments, but, but um, well, I mean. I think the best thing is to is tighten. We still have like quite a few data there, and especially if we like send back like you know a probe there, and maybe we can really figure out what the aerosols are made of. And I think that would be really the best way to really. I mean, I don't think we can really transpose like the lab experiments to the planetary atmosphere. It should really be used like. Uh, like you would do a model, you know, it's just like, okay, I'm trying to test this hypothesis and it works or not, but you shouldn't just take what you get from the lab experiment and, you know, transpose it. Well, so there's been a lot of uh, optical measurements that I didn't talk about. So essentially, well, I would say uh, it gave some information on the na nature of the aggregates. So, I mean, it's it's low. I mean, Huygens made the measurements close to the um, close to the surface, right? So at this altitude, they did find that like the particles they are like about I don't know, something like 4,000, you need, you need like 4,000 monomers of about 10 nanometers to reproduce the observations. Um, they have some evidence for condensation of uh, HCN and ethane, I think. Um, they don't give any information. I mean, the optical properties won't give you really any information on the chemical composition. It's all about the, the s physical nature and yeah. Well, unfortunately, no, because all these like photochemical models you can go up to like maybe a mass of a hundred or something 
and then you know typically benzene that you we know how to do it it works pretty well on titan but then when you go to like this heavier molecule that there is i mean for these models you need to put all this kinetic data right with all these rate constants and but after like some mass you don't have any data anymore just because it hasn't been measured and it's becoming too complicated like you know for um, like you know then it's basically an explosion of number of molecules and number of reactions and number of everything and it's just becoming increasingly com complicated like you know as you know for these models that extend to maybe uh, 100 amu it's already thousands of reactions and hundreds of species and there is no way you can extend it to like uh, you know something that's like 10,000 atomic mass unit so um, I guess the answer is no. She has some 800 sample, yeah. That's the, I think that's the highest <laughs> she has. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, which, you know, I'm, I'm going the wrong direction. Which one, the Titan one, or? Yeah. Yeah, but the K is much lower. So essentially you would need like so much particles to reproduce the observation that it makes no sense. Well, it's a it's a it's a CH band. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In aliphatic hydrocarbons, I think typically. So <laughs> but he also <laughs> right so that's why i'm saying like you know there have been some improvements when it comes to these lab experiments i mean now people are aware of the oxygen contamination and for example sarah she has this very you know high vacuum reactor so i mean her samples are pretty clean when it comes to oxygen contamination, at least much more clean than most of the other experiments. And she has everything in the nitrogen glove box. She will do the optical properties in the nitrogen, I think, and everything. So, I mean, people have been getting more careful about that. Well, maybe Sarah, you won't say something about it. For exoplanets? Yeah. Which one?
yeah, yeah, I mean, it's very reproducible, the experiments. But um, yeah, I think they really did try to find some correlation with the, you know, gas mixture or something and couldn't really find anything. And I think it's because now they are varying too many parameters at the same time. So these experiments would have to be repeated maybe at, you know, for one given gas mixture at several temperatures or, you know, just to vary one parameter to try to understand what's going on because now it's just, it's more representative, but uh, it's hard to go back and really understand something. 